Leftist Subversion of Language How the Left Enacts Cultural Change Through Language Manipulation By Eternal England In the end, we shall make thought crime literally impossible, because there will be no words in which to express it. George Orwell, 1984 Preface Language is important. Perhaps this statement is redundant. Everybody knows that, right? Perhaps not. I think we have reached a point in political discourse where this fact is too often forgotten by those of us on the rightward end of the political spectrum. The left certainly understands how important language is, especially in its application as a tool for effecting change in collective consciousness. In this essay, I would explore just a few of the many, many ways in which language, and specifically subtle shifts in categorization, can be used to change how society views a topic through the back door, that is, without organically convincing the ordinary person. Gender Identity John Money, a psychologist, sexologist, and actual paedophile, whose research resulted in the suicides of twin brothers on whom he experimented, is the godfather of the gender confusion which surrounds us today. He coined the terms gender role and sexual orientation and also popularized the term gender identity. He once stated, If I were to see the case of a boy aged 10 or 11 who is intensely erotically attracted towards a man in his 20s or 30s, if the relationship is totally mutual and the bonding is genuinely totally mutual, then I would not call it pathological in any way. From the beginning of human history until the 20th century, it was taken for granted that males were boys or men, and females were girls or women. Until 1964, the term gender was only used with regard to linguistics, but then gender identity was coined in order to function as a crowbar to separate biological sex from one's identity. So why was the concept of gender identity created? Sexology has always been a field rife with political activists determined to normalise the abnormal, paraphilias, intergenerational relationships, and various perversions. The Berlin-based Institute for Sexualwissenschaft, founded in 1919, was the vanguard for the science of sexology. It was here that the first genitalumwandlungen, genital transformations, took place. So-called female-to-male treatments were not practiced until the late 1940s, but male-to-female patients were prescribed hormone treatments and would receive castrations, penectomies, and vaginoplasties. Sexologists ran into a wall, though, realizing that they would never be able to convince the general public of the notion that actually changing sex was possible. A construct needed to be introduced, something that could be changed, this is where gender comes in. By resituating the conversation from an empirically observable, objective category, human sexual dimorphism, to an abstract construct of human society, they removed this obstacle. We now see the conflation in everyday speech of sex and gender. For activists, this is consciously done in order to blur the distinction between the two. But in most cases, it is simply because ordinary people don't really understand the difference. The blurring of boundaries is an integral part of the process of deconstructing and reconstructing metaphysical categories. Note the change in language over time from sex change, neutral language, to gender affirmation surgery, a positive framing, implying realignment or fixing a problem. Even after the creation of the concept of gender identity, there was still the issue that transgenderism needed to be normalised in order to liberate those individuals whom it affects from the cruel treatment of a cis-normative society. What is cis-normative, you ask? Cis. Trans is a Latin prefix meaning on the other side of. Cis means the opposite, on this side of. So, while transgenderism is a term for one who feels they are the opposite gender, Cisgender is the term for those whose gender matches their sex. Cis was borrowed from the field of chemistry in order to recreate the binary between those with gender identity disorder, transgender, and those without it, cisgender, into one which gave the left more freedom to work within. 
The previous paradigm of thinking about transsexual issues, as they were called back then, was one in which being transsexual was seen as a state of being which was deviant from the normal. Through the creation of the term cisgender, the binary of normal and transsexual was recreated as the binary of cisgender and transgender. This had the effect of essentializing transgender identity, reframing the conversation from that of a mental condition or a paraphilia into transgenderism being just another equally valid, natural, and essential mode of existence. In other words, changing it from something someone has or is affected by into something someone is, something that makes someone who they are. This is why leftists and trans activists incessantly protest about trans identifying people's existence being erased. When people refuse to go along with the idea that transgenderism is an essential part of a person, it is, in the mind of the leftist or trans activist, akin to genocide. Though they are, of course, not talking about an actual genocide, but a metaphysical one. As you can see from this terribly made diagram, I'm a writer, not a graphic designer. On the left, there are two categories. Normal, as the dominant category in society, and transsexual, which exists on the periphery, outside of the bounds of normality. On the right, we see both sides of the binary existing within the same space to represent their equal validity, with cisgender on top to represent its privileged place in society, and transgender on the bottom, representing the oppression of this group. Now that the concept of transgenderism has been reframed from deviant to the normal, to occupying the position of equally valid but systemically oppressed, the left has set up the stage on which to attempt to deconstruct the concepts of sex and gender entirely. The dialectical goal here is to use the contradictions between cis and transgender as the means by which to abolish gender altogether, to liberate us from the oppression of gender norms and gender roles. We should begin by reframing the language used in these debates. I propose using the term trans-identifying individual. It's easy to understand, and it sounds just scientific and neutral enough that it should give leftists no reason to push back on it. But it also de-essentializes the concept, so the transness isn't being classified as innate, and resituates it as, first and foremost, an identity. Just as the term African-American presents us with a type of American, the term transwoman contains within it the implicit presumption that the person in question is a type of woman. Usage of the term trans-identifying man strips away the essential nature of the description, this is a certain category of woman, and changes the term to better reflect reality, this is a man who identifies as transgender. Of course, the average person with no interest in politics or cultural issues isn't consciously thinking about the use of language here, but that's the whole point. The categories through which we perceive and talk about the world are being ever so subtly distorted to enact a leftward shift in the Overton window, and to impose an idealistic view of the world in which subjective states take primacy over objective reality. We must reject the term cisgender entirely. To use it is to cede linguistic territory in the debate and allow our minds to be colonised by left idealist activists. A note. Personally, I feel that upon meeting a trans-identifying person, the polite thing to do is to simply go along with their choice of pronouns. We may disagree with the concept of transgenderism, but we aren't going to achieve anything by being rude to individuals. Transgender activists are the enemy, not individual trans-identifying people. The Hegelian Dialectic I will now very briefly summarise the dialectical method, as it originates in the work of G.W.F. Hegel. This is an incredibly important point to understand in order to comprehend the worldview of the leftist. To oversimplify grossly, it will suffice to say that the thinking goes like this. In any binary, there is a conflict between the two opposing sides. The contradictions between the two grating against each other will eventually lead to a solution, in which the two halves are dissolved to form a new whole. In the leftist metaphysics chapter of my essay The Spirit of Conservatism, I detail how white feminism and black feminism were dialectically synthesized to form intersectionality th theory. The dialectical monomania of the left is why, for their purposes, it's no good having a bunch of different races, black, white, Asian, indigenous, etc., 
a binary must be set up in order to progress. As leftists already view the world through a lens in which white people are the oppressors of all other groups, the binary of whites and non-whites already exists in their minds. But as whites are quite content with the current state of the West, which leftists perceive as a white supremacist hellscape, the consciousness of non-whites as a group must be raised. That is, non-whites must come to realise their subordinate position as a member of the non-whites group in the binary opposition of whites and non-whites as a prerequisite in order to group together to effect change and overthrow the white supremacist system. Doesn't this all sound exhaustingly idealistic? That's because it is. People of colour. The term people of colour was invented to take the place of non-whites, because the term non-white is relational, it exists only in opposition to white, whereas people of colour stands alone. Nevertheless, the binary of people of colour versus white people has been constructed, an abstraction which includes vastly diverse groups of people within it against another abstraction. White is also an abstraction. I'm looking at you, white nationalist. On the left side of this diagram, we have one circle showing the old view of race relations, in which all races are included, with white in the middle to symbolise their privileged status, and the other groups existing on the margins, included, but not occupying centre stage. On the right, we see a binary in which whites are on top, representing their power and privilege, while people of colour are on the bottom, to symbolise that, although this category makes up one side of the binary, they are subordinated and oppressed by white supremacy. The strategic ingenuity of the creation of this term is that it creates a unity between such disparate groups in order to focus their collective power at their oppressors, the whites. Some groups may have very little in common, and in fact long-standing hostility and distrust between them, such as Korean Americans and black Americans after the 1991 Latasha Harlins killing and the looting of Korean-owned stores in the 1992 LA riots. But when the conversation is made into how white people are privileged as opposed to people of colour and oppress them, all the individual differences between the groups contained within people of colour are obscured. Yes, Asian Americans are, on the whole, doing very well for themselves in America, but they're still oppressed. What frustrates me to no end is the layers and layers of abstraction used in modern political discourse. By using these group signifiers, white, black, Asian, etc., we are obscuring the fact that contained within each of these groups are millions of individuals coming from different family backgrounds, making different decisions with different interests and hopes and dreams. To talk of any of these groups as if the individuals contained within them are a monolith is frankly racist. Maybe white people do own X percent of the wealth despite making up Y percent of the population, but that is an abstraction based on averages which means nothing in the real world lives of individuals. We create abstract categories, and then create further categories within which to hold the former categories. People of colour is an abstraction constituted of a collection of other abstractions, but left idealism demands this kind of thinking. Abstract binaries must be created from disparate groups in order to plug it into the dialectical calculus. Don't fall into the trap of capitalising black or white. This is designed to make the topic of race occupy a larger space in societal consciousness than it deserves. Black and white are not nouns, they are adjectives. Don't capitalise just black like the critical race theory freaks. Don't capitalise just white like the neo-Nazis. Don't capitalise both. Capitalise neither. Asian, African and European are fine. They refer to the continent from which the people originate. In conclusion, pay attention to the way that you see language used around you. Learn to notice when somebody says something that just doesn't quite sit right with you, and take a moment to reflect on why that is. Perhaps you'll realise that their choice of words contained an implication that they hoped nobody would notice. Look for these patterns of dialectical thinking in political discourse. If somebody is setting up an abstract binary, see it for what it is, and remind yourself that nothing is ever that simple. Abstractions are, by necessity, not based in reality. We are always better off grounding ourselves in the real, material world, rather than living in the world of ideas. Refuse to cede the linguistic territory when the left creates new terms. The left's strategy of cultural dilution and deconstruction relies on gaslighting society into never-ending doubt. Quote, the past was alterable. 
the past had never been altered. Oceania was at war with East Asia. Oceania had always been at war with East Asia. George Orwell, 1984